Good morning and welcome again to the Japan Society's regular webinar, always discussing issues in world affairs that are relevant to both the UK and Japan. My name is Bill Emmett and I have the honor and pleasure of chairing the Japan Society. Today's topic is nominally the media, but I must offer a confession at the outset that despite having been a journalist throughout my career, I've never been very interested in the media per se, except occasionally as a business story. I've always been interested instead in what the media tells us and sometimes doesn't tell us about the world around, about the answers it provides to the four basic questions that are fundamental to journalism. What's happening? Why is it happening? Why does it matter? And where might it lead? In recent decades, the greatest transformation in information and communication concerning news and analysis has come in foreign affairs. As in earlier eras, technology has made the flow of information in all its forms far cheaper and quicker. The 19th century transformations came, of course, from steamships, railways, and above all, the electric telegraph, but obviously the transformations of our era have come from satellites, from cheap telecommunications, and above all, from the internet. A world, when I began in journalism, of telegrams and telexes, for broadcasters of film being transported physically, of long time lags between events and their being reported, has become the instant world of CNN and Al Jazeera, of Skype and Zoom, of citizen journalism, a film of events taken on smartphones. Moreover, a world of domestic television channels, which allocated portions of news and of documentary programming to international affairs, has become a multi-channel specialized world in which both BBC World and NHK World operate magnificently, yet often in seemingly in a separate universe from their huge domestic parents. Information and analysis of world affairs is abundantly available but it is available by choice, as if on an a la carte menu for us consumers, rather than being laid out in front of us on a buffet, as at least the nostalgic among us imagined it was before. So while information and communications have been transformed, some eternal verities nevertheless remain. Policymakers can still be ignorant or blinkered about matters outside their borders. A global pandemic indeed can take place, and yet governments and publics alike can remain surprisingly detached from the examples and experiences displayed by other countries. Information is abundant, as I said, but understanding is not. And of course, for the journalist, that gap between information and understanding is what enables us to get paid, to get a job. The fundamental question that all editors must ask their reporters remains the same. About your story, so what? And about what you've done, how are you providing us something that is better than your competitors and better than people already know? What value are you really added, adding? So our question today is what is happening in foreign affairs on the media? What is the modern role of foreign reporting and of the foreign correspondent? How do our huge public broadcasters, the BBC and NHK, think about foreign coverage and the role it plays for their viewers? So we are truly fortunate to have two outstanding specimens of the genus foreign correspondent. In Tokyo, I welcome my friend Aiko Doden, who many of you will have seen on NHK World, where she currently presents the program Newsline in Depth. Having been based in Bangkok, Aiko has reported extensively on Southeast Asia and has taken a special interest in Myanmar. As she spent six years living in Britain as a child, I rather suspect she knows quite a lot about us too. And from Oxford, I welcome another great friend, the remarkable John Simpson, a man who is recognizable in virtually every country in the world, thanks to his more than half a century of reporting for the BBC. It is no wonder he had to wear a burqa, famously to disguise himself in Afghanistan. We have in common the fact that John lived for a time in Dublin and now resides in Oxford, but in pre-COVID times, I mainly seem to run into John in airport lounges. As usual, each speaker will open with 10 minutes of remarks, after which we will have a discussion with, most importantly, your questions. 
please submit your questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and you can vote for other people's questions to promote them and bring them to my attention. This week, I'm going to be begin in Britain, or rather in Oxford, with John Simpson. Over to you, John, and welcome to the Japan Society. Thank you, Bill, and what an honor it is to be uh, on this panel, um, uh, especially with, with Aika. Um, Alan Rusbridger, the former editor of The Guardian, now the head of a, an Oxford college, uh, wrote me in to uh, give a, a talk to large number of students. Very pleasant, uh, charming, delightful occasion it was. And at one stage, uh, when he ran through the various things I've, I've uh, kind of done or been at, he said, I, I don't suppose there'll ever be a career again like John's. To be absolutely honest, I was a little bit um, miffed by this because I, you know, I don't like to be presented as a kind of dinosaur figure, the last of the, uh, of the old foreign correspondents. But of course, he's, he's absolutely right. Uh, the, the world that I grew up in and uh, enjoyed um, is dead in terms of uh, the, the professional qualifications and professional scope of, of what the foreign correspondent does. We do have foreign correspondents now, of course, uh, people based in other people's countries. Um, but the number of centers where they're based is shrinking quite quite uh, considerably and so is the money to pay them and foreign correspondents uh, like ambassadors are expensive items and if the money isn't there and it increasingly uh, it isn't there any longer uh, then it becomes quite hard to keep a, a, an office, a bureau going, just as it's quite harder, it's become harder to keep a, an embassy going. So newspapers, a television, radio have all suffered in their, in their incomes in different ways. I mean, it's not all that long ago since I thought, well, at least the BBC with its, um, uh, its strange uh, to British eyes funding system of the license fee, like, like NHK, like actually many, many uh, um, organizations in, in Europe, not in, in, the, in the Americas, but it becomes uh, harder and harder. And as we've seen in Australia and are now seeing in Britain, there's real pressure from governments uh, to uh, rein in the, the the national broadcaster and the easy way to do that, the kind of leash that the dog runs on is, is cash. And in one way or another, it's become really increasingly difficult uh, for uh, national broadcasters to continue in the way that they once did. Um, there are organizations uh, which still continue on the, the, the kind of grand old scale. Uh, Reuters news agency has to, the Associated Press has to. It doesn't have correspondence in weird and wonderful places when something happens, then they, they suffer. They're in, they've got real problems. Their clients say, how come you didn't? tip us off about what was going on in Azerbaijan or Nagorno-Karabakh or something like that. So they have to have people everywhere. It's harder for broadcasters like NHK, like, uh, like uh, the BBC, because the expectation is often that there will be um, a, an NHK person, an, a BBC person, perhaps known to the viewers in the different places that they report on. We cannot, the BBC cannot now afford to do that. And so increasingly we rely on freelances and often people uh, that live uh, and have been brought up locally. Now that has 
huge advantages, of course. Uh, a local person can know what's happening in the country uh, that he or she is reporting on in ways that no outsider, no nobody like myself, for instance, could conceivably gather. I mean, you know it from your mother's milk. Um, but there are, there are problems about that. Uh, your family uh, lives around you. Will they suffer if you report something which the government happens not to like? Or not just the government, of course, but the drugs cartels or the, the, the local big um, mafia bosses. These things are, are, a, are a problem for good, honest, straight reporting. We tend, uh, broadcasters and, and newspapers, tend to rather keep quiet, I, I, I feel, about that. I, it's always seemed to me that the, the honest and straightforward thing to do is to, is to be, be open about it and to talk about the ways in which the news comes to us and the, the, the kind of people and the background that it, that it comes to. But it does have to be done um, with, with, with care and skill. Then again, reporting itself is becoming more difficult. And when you get action taken against the, um, the children of foreign correspondents, as happened uh, recently with uh, some Australian um, correspondents' family in China, um, then you can see the kind of pressure that governments uh, increasingly are placing on on the, the the foreign correspondents based in their countries it's done with a certain amount of sophistication in china and i've um, i've always found it possible uh to as long as you understand the rules that, that the chinese government establishes uh, to be able to to use those rules uh, to some extent to your advantage and to be able to work around the other ones that you can't um and it, it it anyway is usually out of the hands of individuals like me i mean it's the relationship between the chinese government and the australian government between the chinese government and the canadian government and the american governments and so on uh, and in this of course individuals account for actually very little and their families are, are merely the pawns on the board um, but there are other problems for reporting which used not to exist in the way that they do uh, nowadays. Um, Syria, for instance. I mean, I've, I've done a certain amount of reporting from Syria, but it is or it has been so appallingly dangerous that really you 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 have to wonder uh, how what a you know whether it is really a terribly good idea to go to a town which nobody has heard of and can pronounce to see what's happening there that day for a story which to be honest uh, isn't going to create much attention and my um my great uh, um friend Murray Colvin uh died doing precisely that, a, a wonderful, wonderful, brave woman uh, whose life was snuffed out in, in, in the kind of fighting that just kind of slips everybody's memories now, sadly. Um, and not only that, but places like Libya, where journalists have become a, a, a serious target. Libya I, I, is easier a little bit to, uh, to, to report on, but uh, easier certainly than Syria. And it's, the situation is just five or 10 degrees easier to understand for, um, uh, for a foreign audience. But increasingly, things that we would have regarded as, as of considerable importance, the movement of the government forces on a particular town, uh, the um, uh, mutiny in a in another town, something like this that would have been perhaps the second item on the news, perhaps even the first item if it was uh, really um, uh, important and interesting. Uh, these things have faded, 
And nowadays, uh, I, I, it's not only the BBC by any manner of means uh, that finds it hard, first of all, to justify putting its correspondents in positions of great danger, and secondly, using the material that they, that they bring back. That's a, that's a real problem when the world kind of thinks of, of Syria, Libya, whatever, as just a, a, a troubled and awkward place that is very hard to understand. We, an inter interdependent world needs information, of course it does, but the money aspect of it has become even more important than the safety aspect. And until such time as we um, can find a, a way of finding, getting the money together to be able to get the decent reporting that we've become used to, then we've got, uh, we've got problems in our profession. Well, thank you, John. That's a that's a, a very salutary um, reminder of uh, or illustration of what's going on, and uh, we'll we'll address it during questions about. Um, particularly, I'd like to uh, explore well, what things now editors back in uh, back home will put up high up in the news and what they won't. I think that's uh, um, a very interesting part of, of what you said that uh, you know, one puts as an editor puts uh, journalists into physical danger, and then consider there's no point in doing that if you consider the story to be not very important um, but what stories are considered important well I think we'll we'll get on to that um, in a moment but I'm going to go to Aiko Doden in Tokyo at NHK who's kindly taken time off from uh, editing a feature for tomorrow's broadcast um, to speak to us how do things look from from Tokyo Aiko? Thank you um, good evening and konbanwa from Tokyo now, what a great honor for me to be a part of this event. Um, I'd like to thank Japan Society and Mr. Emmert for this opportunity. You know, the nature of my work is such that I interview um, heads of states, Nobel laureates, royalties, rock stars, and film stars. But this event is probably the most intimidating of all. You know, I am literally sandwiched between the two star journalists, and I feel very humbled. And normally for me to take part in an outside event like this, I will have to have nine seals stamped on the approval form, which will then be submitted to the management with a letter from the organizer attached. The management this time decided that this webinar should be considered work and that there was no need for me to collect the nine hanko or the name seals. Now perhaps it's Mr. Emmett's letter that did the magic, like the black ship that arrived on the shore of Japan in 1850s to bring it out of isolation. I add that the letter arrived way before Mr. Kono, our Minister for Administrative and Le Regulatory Reform, tweeted that he will work to get rid of name seals from government business. So we will see how COVID-19 might accelerate these welcoming changes in Japan. At the very start of my career, a childhood friend of mine gave me this book as a gift. Can you see? Um, oh. It's turned the other way around, but uh, it's Dispatches from the Barricades by Mr. John Simpson, with his detailed account of the defining moments in modern history in 1989 to 1990. Now, I have held on to this book since then throughout my career. The state of the world has changed significantly, but I believe what the book says remains relevant in terms of how it helps us to gauge where we are today. And my takeaway from the book was that journalists at any time, at anywhere, are charged with a mission to report and record, as they often witness history in the making. And I hope that my takeaway still holds true when conventional media like NHK are all faced with fierce competition with other forms of media. Because unlike the time I joined the business, anyone with a smartphone can literally disseminate news and go ahead reporting it on the social media. But with COVID-19, reporters have had to adjust to their new normal, including teleworking, which Japan is relatively behind. Now, it has been a difficult time for everybody, but also an exciting and testing six months for me. 
the Skype interviews have started to become the norm, even for key documentaries. And, and interviewees were also willing to accommodate the time difference in order to reach out to us. Uh, Taiwan's digital minister, Audrey Tan, Hong Kong students' activist, Nathan Law, Jacques Attali, uh, Yuval Noah Harari, uh, Francis Fukuyama, uh, co-founder of BLM, Opal Tomeiti, Nobel Prize laureate Dennis Mukwege and others have all agreed to be on our crisis interview series titled Living Beyond the Pandemic. Um, in the old normal, this would require a lot of fuss, the securing appointment, booking rooms, flying in with the crew and paying them. And also there is an encouraging sign that viewers are gravitating towards some serious news and in-depth um, documentaries you know, there are news and information out there in the social media updated literally every minute or even less. And old media have had to compete online too. But viewers appear to be looking for something analytic, uh, in-depth and inspiring to live through this perilous time. Perhaps they see a kind of frontier of knowledge or thoughts in the minds of those being interviewed. And I believe that TV media is also rediscovering that frontier that we'll still need to tap into. Just a small footnote about NHK. Um, NHK, as you know, is not state owned. It is a public broadcaster supported by viewers fee. This system ensures editorial independence and neutrality, meaning programs and programming will not be influenced by the government or uh, private organizations. NHK World TV, where I primarily work, is now available to about 380 million households in about 160 countries as of March this year. The scale of our operation may be dwarfed by other outlets like, say, China's state-run CCTV, but the roles and the mission might differ. As the tagline for NHK World, Your Eye on Asia, goes, its comparative advantage lies in reporting Asia, with 14 bureaus out of 31 scattered around the region. And today, in a region where freedom of the press is viewed to be at risk in some countries, viewers do look for accurate, fair analysis and reporting on Asia, and NHK aspires to meet that demand. But having said that, um, I have felt that the words like international news or news on Asia need to be scrutinized because it can sometimes sound as if Japan is not part of it. You know, Asia or international society on one side and Japan on the other. Uh, that may come from the practice that the foreign policy is mainly handled by the political reporters covering prime minister's office and the foreign ministry. And international news reporters are usually tasked to cover certain regions, say North America, Europe, South Asia, Africa, and so on. So what happens to issues that go across the borders like climate change or migration, the poverty, um, infectious disease, the human trafficking, or universal issues as a human rights? Uh, sadly, they can be no one's business. So pandemic like COVID-19, which knows no border, is bound to shake up the organizational structure and our mindset to be better prepared for these uh, issues. Um, Japan-US relations or Japan-China relations, Korean Peninsula, the UK, EU, Russia, these bilateral relations will all continue to matter. matter. But players in international news have also diversified, and so the tools of observation also need to be updated from state-centric levels of analysis to one that takes into consideration diverse a range of players from you know, individuals to civil societies, foundations, uh, NGOs, enterprises, and so on. So cross-sectional um, interdisciplinary approach are very much in order. If I may go a little further, I'd like to think that uh, rather than uh, reactively reporting on the news that happens, media's role can transform into one that, that is more proactive uh, by alerting the, the public of imminent crisis, the drawing viewers' attention to stories that are uh, unfolding, 
uh, whether it be COVID-19 or climate change or human rights violation, and play a proactive role in the collective effort to address the challenges in bringing about a more inclusive and a more equitable world. Um, all this presents new opportunities for foreign correspondents on foreign news and sh should keep old normal journalists on their toes. Um, I pr myself present programs, I do commentaries, I produce reports, and I also film my stories myself. Uh, because I uh, can be ubiquitous in how I work and where I work, um, some people mistakenly think that I have gone freelancing um, at last, because it is typical for reporters around my age in Japan to, to sit comfortably behind the desk and assume the managerial role. Um, I do not intend to claim the credit for focusing on SDGs or issues with human security implications, but having been based in Bangkok as correspondent, um, there were issues that um, cross borders that just cannot go untold. Um, Japan's relations with US, China, the UK or Russia continue to top the list of news to cover. But where I chose to set my tripods, so to speak, were usually in the suburbs or the provinces in the field where people lived their lives. And I learned that the reality was in the detail on the ground. And that might be why I was fascinated to read um, in Mr. Simpson's account about how people were dressed as they walked on the streets of Beijing just before the uprising, or how one student came to shake his hands, or how one Rom Romanian writer was skeptical of um, execution of Ceausescu, bringing a closure to the era. Those were the episodes that were equally compelling as his interactions with leaders and high profile figures. So in covering ASEAN, it's usually the size of the market or the speed of its growth um, or the decisions made by the leaders that grab the headlines. But to me, how a former military officer in Myanmar, say, sees the upcoming election, or if a street vendor thinks her life has improved in any way in Laos, or what Thai people meant when they prayed hard for the long life of the late king, and why young Cambodian are uh, taking part in the restoration effort of Angkor Wat, led by a Magsay Sai awardee, an 80-year-old Japanese historian. Now, these realities matter to me as I covered the region. Um, in conclusion, I'd like to say that um, Kofi Annan, the former UN Secretary General, said to me that journalists can also contribute in uh, building peace. Um, I later took part in the R2P responsibility to protect South Asia Working Group in early 2000 and argue that uh, journalists have the responsibility to report. And I still believe that journalists can uh, make bite-sized contribution by shedding light on less reported issues, paying attention to details and alerting people of potential risks and dangers that we are likely to confront in a world where injustice and inequality have become more visible in a COVID-19 world. And I do want to believe that in that context, foreign correspondents and what they do are still very much alive and relevant in the world today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aiko San. That was a marvelously uplifting and um, a very clear uh, exposition of, of what it is you're doing and why, how you think about it, um, which I think has, again, eternal messages for our times. I'm going to pick up um, on one um, issue before going on to the excellent questions that are coming in, um, because I was very struck by your use of or emphasis on, the, on how journalists should be or can be proactive. Uh, in um, in uh, describing and uh, and uh, and alerting to the news, and I want to ask, uh, put that to John Simpson and his response. I mean, if I may say, as a as a viewer of uh, of Simpson Sam, um, that one thing that you you're obviously proactive in choosing the places and the and and what you report on, but one characteristic of you as a journalist is that you're not personally incredibly ju judgmental. You do not, when you give a report, give, as it were, an economist editorial. Uh, you are particular. You are you are very careful to do that. I think. How do you see that balance, and how is it evolving in in reporting, John? I think there are some things which 
it's absolutely our, our duty to take a strong view on um, the the murder of journalists, for yeah. instance, um, the efforts of of some governments to uh, to clamp down on on types of journalism, uh, whether domestic or foreign. But what I don't think is my job to tell people what to think. I don't feel, you know, there's a line, uh, I should have looked it up before I, I uh, start uh, treading on all this, but Chekhov, the, uh, the great uh, Russian playwright, said that really his purpose as a, uh, as a playwright was to uh, write down the, write the character, write the, write the, the uh, circumstances of the interaction of the, of the characters, and then leave it to the audience to work out what they think about the characters themselves and their natures and about, about what they want to do. And, I feel that that's the purpose of uh, the, certainly the kind of journalism that I'm involved in, um, not to not to tell people what to think, not to not even to say that one side in a in a in a, a dispute of some kind uh, is closer to the right than some other than some other side, because I don't feel that's my job to make judgments like that. I think that you should just simply present it on a plate as, as honestly and openly as you can and give it to the viewer, the reader, the listener and say, okay, that's how I see it. Now you make your mind up. Lovely. No, I think uh, absolutely. I think that puts um, uh, very well what I think of as your as your philosophy. But of course, I, and Aiko, uh, you are saying really that you are proactive in choosing the subjects, but not in, as it were, lecturing about them, I think is uh, you're, you're identifying the subjects. Um, right. Highlighting things. Yes, uh, that, that's what I hope that, I, that, I, that I'm doing. Um, I don't mean to uh, be preaching uh, my viewers, um, telling them how to think or what to do. But, but um, when covering some remotest part of the world, I find that um, you know, that there are many, many issues that still need to be told unless I covered it. Um, and so part of journalist's mission would be to, to visit, well, in this um, COVID-19 world, it, traveling has become a bit difficult, but to try and uh, provide um, information and, um, you know, let the viewers um, study the information and the insights and um, encourage them to, to uh, formulate the, the thoughts of their own. Now this fits very much with a question um, of two top questions that have, that have come in, but let me do the second one first. Andrew Elliott has written in saying he's interested in Ico and John's views on the role played by the news media, not just in reporting about the world, but in constructing or creating images of the world for viewers and also images of Britain or Japan around the world. In your own experience, to what extent do such concerns inform the selection of news stories, their research, writing, and broadcasting? Are you, John, conscious that you are, as it were, creating an image, or do you um, somewhat leave that to the um, gal lighters back in, um, in the broadcasting house? Well, uh, the, yes. I mean, there aren't really any gal lighters. One of the great things about broadcasting, I mean, I'm, I'm sure I co and I uh, share the, the pleasure of this, is that actually there isn't really anybody between you and the, the audience. Um, on a newspaper, of course, there the are immense numbers of gal lighters. Dare I say it, must have been one or two uh, on the, in The Economist, because you want to uh, present a, a kind of clear, uh, coherent approach to, to, to the buyers of the magazine. Um, television news in particular isn't the same as that. It doesn't, you can't take um, uh, for granted 
any individual responses, reactions to what you're doing. If you say, uh, um, if you make some, some kind of clear point about the, the nature of the economic policies of a, of a government, you're speaking to people, some of whom will feel deeply offended by any suggestion that there is a, a proper way of directing an economy. Others will be equally furious that you're not um, presenting uh, the facts as they want them to be presented. I don't mean to say that when I do a report, everybody nods sagely and says, oh yes, that's the word of truth. Because of course you can, I mean, I know from the letters and the uh, the tweets I get that people spit blood at what I say and feel I've betrayed every decent notion in in existence. But I think you have to have a, a clarity of view and then and and stick to that. And I feel that both in Ioka's case and and in mine, um, it's it's that sense that you just have to say to people, look, I'm telling you, I honestly, genuinely believe this is true because I've been there and I've seen it and I've talked to many of the, or some of the people involved. Now, you know, I, 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 all I can do is to tell you that, uh, that that is my belief and present you with what things look like and not try to angle it um, or, or please somebody or, or, or whatever. I don't, am I being too preachy? I don't mean to be preachy at all, but that is, I think, what, what good broadcasting is about. And Aiko san do you, do you feel conscious of, as it were, portraying Japan on Japan's interests and thoughts to the world through NHK World? Um, I think you'd share the principle that John has just described, but are you, do you, is there an extra role that you and NHK feel that you're doing? Are you an ambassador? Well, um, I, I don't think um, we aim to to um, sort of represent the, the government views. Um, you know, we, we all have our independent and individual uh, decision in terms of how we uh, select the news and how we report it. And personally, I, I sort of re regard it as a like a conversation, really, whenever I do news reporting or produce documentaries. At uh, the moment um, I choose you know, what topic to discuss, um, I am bound to influence a viewer's uh, view of the world in, in some way or other. But it doesn't mean that um, I am imposing upon my viewers um, how they should view the world. Well, one thing I try to be careful is um, this uh, d dumbing down things, you know, um, e editors or colleagues or any team producing some stories or um, features tend to want to, to make a story kind of easy enough for viewers to understand. And then the story can lose all the, the flavors or the details that should matter. And um, I tend to feel that it's so condescending on the part of journalists to think that uh, you have to dumb down the stories for the viewers to understand because they are they they are far more knowledgeable than we are often good i'm delighted you you think that i'm as very much of, of of that view as well i mean obviously i've been in print journalism all my life but i absolutely think that the idea of dumbing down is just a almost a criminal act mm -hmm. criminal idea and uh, very condescending towards the readers and the viewers i think you're absolutely right uh now christopher hood has posed a question which is sort of somewhat um, directed at the at the as it were the the companies the organisers the, the the organisations as much as the broadcasters but I'll see what you both think about it um, and I know I share some of his concern as a as a as an old newspaper man he says do you believe that the media has forgotten its role of seeking truth justice and helping to better human society in the pursuit for maintaining its own existence through producing articles, in the case of print, that bring clicks and activities that bring in revenue and sometimes even notoriety, thereby letting big companies and governments in particular off the hook? If so, what can be done to reverse this trend? Um, I certainly think, I mean, John, what do you think? I, you know, as a, as a print man, I think that measuring impact is one of the worst um, 
the worst, uh, one of the worst activities that now happens in, in, in journalism, that uh, clickbait becomes the measure. But is that really your experience in broadcasting at all? Uh, it's less in broadcasting, but I think it's, um, I'm afraid I think that is the direction that, that broadcasting in general is going. I mean, I, I feel really disturbed by the notion that we're going to have now uh, a, a 24 hour news service, uh, a new one uh, called GB Radio, I think, um, which is going to be right wing, uh, I, I, which is going intentionally to be, to be right wing. I just find the idea that you slant the news from the left or the right or, 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 or whatever um, deeply, deeply disturbing and i think you know news news is should surely be sacred and not something that that you pump opinion into all the time we've seen the damage that that that, that happened when the federal communications commission in the united states was uh, instructed uh, during uh, ronald reagan's presidency to drop its demand that broadcasting the news uh, and, and current affairs should be balanced in some way, it should, should be uh, free of, of the strongest uh, political opinions. We've seen how America has been ripped into two in this, and now it looks as though Britain is, is going to follow. I'm sure Japan would never, never make that that what I think of as a terrible mistake. Reassure us, uh, Aiko-san. I mean, uh, do you feel that, uh, obviously not at NHK, that's a, uh, those are different issues, but are, is there any tendency towards the politicization of broadcast news um, in the Japanese market? Well, um, commercial televisions, well, I, I can't speak for others really, but um, they, they usually tend to have to pay more closer attention to the ratings. At NHK, we do pay attention to ratings, but uh, that doesn't mean that uh, we compromise um, the, the substance of the news or the, the documentaries that we are producing. Um, in that respect, um, we might be the endangered species, and I must be one of the lucky ones not to be um, consumed by constantly being worried about the ratings. But that doesn't mean that uh, we continue producing programs that are high quality, but not very you know, palatable, so to say. So that there's a constant uh, struggle to try and get as many viewers to, to watch um, the, the programs without um, the compro compromising the, the substance um, of the, the program, which, which is not very easy. Now, on another issue of, uh, that is difficult in, in reporting um, and in, in the, the difference between truth and falsehood, Sue Hudson, who's one of my our board members, has, and who works for Fu Fuji Sankei Communications, um, one of the big commercial um, television and other media companies, says she knows people who think that the news from Syria is, quote, fake news, despite them being intelligent people otherwise. How can, how does a correspondent try to ensure that people understand or believe that it is the truth in basic terms that is being reported? I mean, John, I think this is a sort of an eternal struggle of, um, of, uh, of, of, of uh, journalistic life, but do you think that it is more difficult now? Yes, I think it is because there is that, that constant um, uh, kind of theme that runs through uh, our Western societies now um, that says that, you know, these things are, are fake, that big organizations uh, and big money, money organizations fake things, that it isn't it isn't true and we're being fed a line. Now, I've always, of course, uh, like many journalists in particular, always thought it was a really good idea to be sceptical. But, um, and I still do think that scepticism is a, is a, is a, should be a basic principle. But somehow um, the idea that you're being constantly lied to 
about a particular issue, for instance. Uh, Syria is one example, but I mean, you know, there was Brexit in, in Britain, um, although I think there was a lot of lying that went on uh, in the Brexit debate. But the idea that there is some sort of consistent uh, um, lying used to be, when I was a, a young reporter and correspondent, just the, the the province of the of the the lunatic uh, there were there were plenty of them relatively large numbers my father was one of them my father was absolutely convinced that the BBC was a a, a, a left-wing um, a conspiracy uh, which whose sole intention really was to lie uh, to to the to the viewer and listener about what the real world was about when I started to work for it, um, I, I'm glad to say he uh, he changed his mind. Whether that was because me or the BBC, I'm not sure. But the, uh, that kind of attitude in the 60s, for instance, um, has grown and grown and grown until it's it's really very large indeed. And all the the kind of social networks which now are available to people simply bulk it up and make everybody think that this is in some way uh, a majority opinion. It's still a very small opinion, but it's it's one of the more disturbing things that those of us who work in the, in the media, whether in Britain or, or Japan, have to bear in mind. No, absolutely. I've, I, personally, I've always thought that um, the idea that, we, that uh, the media was following any sort of conspiracy required a great belief in our ability to organize anything and indeed particularly to, <laughs> to <laughs> obey orders. But nevertheless, it is absolutely persistent. Now, um, Yuichiro Nakajima has asked uh, you, uh, Aiko san, about um, uh, a particular question about NHK and particularly about NHK World, which I wonder if you can address. He says, Doden, uh, Doden san, what can the NHK do to raise its, um, lab, its visibility uh, and I interrupted myself there because I had to stop my laptop from updating itself, which is one of these terrible uh, problems. Um, let me get through it. Uh, and it raise its visibility and credibility among its international viewers and listeners. In other words, is there any way in which it come more like the BBC, putting aside the question of history and accumulated goodwill uh, that the world appears to have towards the BBC? Is it simply about a, a matter of money? What is really your sense of the ambition of NHK World? Um, in, in its visibility around the world? Well, um, maybe to, to the, the, there is no secret formula really, but, but maybe two things I want to say. One is that um, um, following up on the, the previous discussion about the fake news, um, if a public broadcaster buys into uh, a fake news, um, it's you know, it, credibility as a decent media will erode. So we have to be particularly be careful and be cautious enough to not uh, buy into that. Um, you know, be, be cautious than be too bold in reporting um, uh, a news um, uh, unless you have ways to, to verify it. And, and this fake news thing is not very new. I mean, when I was covering uh, Myanmar 20 years ago, um, there were no um, t Twitters or Facebooks, or, but there were fake news that, that Aung San Suu Kyi was being released today or, or something like that. Uh, and so that's something that we have to be careful for. Um, that's the basic, basic thing that we have to keep in mind. The, the, the second thing is that for NHK World to, to raise its visibility, that, that's what we are constantly talking about in our offices. Uh, and I do believe that for one, um, ad addressing the, the the key issues that matter um, in in a world today, you know, putting together a future feature or uh, conducting, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one direct interviews to let the world know that it's not just the BBC that the key people might want to speak to. If I may, I think if I may, as a viewer, just pop in a quick, a quick um, view. I, I, my view, one of the problems for NHK World is that you have very excellent uh, foreign affairs reporting of that sort. But quite a lot of the coverage, if one looks at it on a satellite, is, that, is, is about Japan. 
and uh, one is left with a kind of um, schizophrenic view about is this as it were a window on Japan or is it a, a window on the world to be compared with the BBC and CNN and, uh, and, and the others? Right. Um, I think I know what you mean. Um, and I can't speak for all my colleagues at NHK World, but I tend to want to think that um, NHK World reporting is not just about Japan, but about Japan's perspectives on uh, world affairs and Asian perspectives on world affairs. Um, we are not um, reporting news or uh, producing uh, programs to sort of let the world know about Japan um, as a sort of a PR um, tool. Um, what we try to do is to, to present um, our world viewers with the Japan or Asian perspective on the issues that matter to people in the world today. Yes. Now, Nicholas McLean has followed up your point, John, about um, the trend for journalists to become targets for violence. Um, and he wants to know, is this mainly, do you think, due to hostile states, um, the sort of Chinese syndrome that you were talking about, or is it particularly hostile freelance groups where you were talking about drug, drug cartels and, of course, uh, of course, terrorist groups as well? Um, could our speakers also comment on the risk that media people will be used as pawns or points of leverage in other disputes? Have we become uh, simply a tool for, to, for international statesmanship? Um, well, I, that is, I've, I'm afraid, uh, a fact. Um, journalists have always had a, a reaching right back for 100 years, 120 years, uh, have, have always been seen as as some kind of representative of their of their country or maybe their political system and 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 so forth. And of course. Um, in more recent times, in the last sort of 40, 40 years or so, uh, it, it's become absolutely clear that if you kidnap a journalist or shoot a journalist, you're going to get more uh, attention uh, than if you kill, a, I don't know what, a tax inspector or a bus driver. Uh, you're going to, people are going to be aware of your cause on a much, much wider um, basis than they would be if, if, uh, if, if, if it was simply domestic um, people domestically that you were that you were killing. So this is something that we have to uh, to live with to some extent, and we ought to be uh, careful about things. But um, I I lived for many years with a, a wonderful American woman who was a a, a journalist, and uh, she got very upset uh, one day. I remember when we were watching uh, a long program about uh, journalists complaining about how dangerous their life was and she she said whoever went into journalism because it was a safe profession. She shouted this out and I've always always remembered it ever since. I mean you know if you don't want to do it don't don't do it. Take the necessary, all the necessary precautions. But if there's a point at which you think this is now too dangerous, then step aside because there will be somebody else who's prepared to do it. And, you know, just as we always uh, feel that there's something wrong when the journalist becomes the story in such an, in, 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 in some way or another. So, I mean, I do think it is quite, quite worrying when uh, the way that things are, are reported uh, put people's lives into some kind of, of, of danger. But that is the world we live in. And, you know, be, be, a, be a, a chartered accountant if you don't like the work. Quite so, quite so. No, absolutely. Um, I do remember putting a, um, a, a young Iranian protester on the cover of The Economist, I should say. Who, this photo had been taken not by us, but by Reuters, but we put it on, um, and he was sentenced to death. Um, and, you know, the flip side is the responsibility you take. And we tried to intervene, as it were, and so forth. And the family said, please keep away. Don't interfere. We don't want any publicity around this. And they were right, because eventually he was freed. I mean, about 10 years later. Um, but uh, it, is, it does show the sort of the world that one has to, has to, um, has to enter. Michael Cupbill has asked, 
does the BBC do enough to argue that reporting on, oh, now I've lost it, I'll move these things, move up and down. Anyway, reporting on the wider world should be seen as a public good, fundable by the state in the same way as health or security. Um, the opposite approach to survival funding directly from the readers, as in The Guardian, and another questioner asked about The Guardian model or Wikipedia's appeals, are they surely doomed to fail in the long run? Do you think that the case for, for, for public funding of, of, uh, of, of media and the public good is, is, is now a dinosaur case, uh, John? And I'll ask Ico that as well. Or is Kennedy? No, I case? just think that um, I just think that we did it uh, the, the wrong way in Britain. And right, dating right back to 1945, when Germany um, was lying in ruins and had to every single aspect of life had to be recreated from scratch. Uh, a group of, of British broadcasters was drafted in to work out what the best way of funding uh, n these new organizations, uh, WDR and, and uh, uh, the rest of the, of the uh, German broadcasters casting community which we're so familiar with today which doesn't have any of these problems about about uh, how it's funded and so forth and this team of BBC people judging from Britain's own experience said don't make it uh, a form of a tax that everybody has to pay because it's too makes it too obvious do it in a quieter way and fund it through in fact, uh, through through uh, simple government expenditure, and it's done very well, very carefully, and um, it's every year uh, the, there's a judgment of about whether the license fee, uh, the equivalent of the license fee, should be raised, and um, nobody makes a fuss about it. It's something which is done through through the taxation, the normal taxation that every citizen pays. And I, I think we are in serious trouble about our funding. Um, I hope that we'll have a government um, uh, which makes a decision which, which understands the value of public service broadcasting and doesn't uh, see it as something to score political points about. But we'll have to see. Hi, Kersan. What do you? NHK is also funded on a basically a license fee type system. But um, how how do how do you see this? And I'll add to it a question: Do you think that the public demand for foreign news has changed during your career? In other words, is the particular task of justifying expenditure on foreign news has that become more difficult? Um, the po politicians tell us that the. Um in a foreign policy does not become an issue um, in, in winning an election. Uh, and that might also hold true for uh, journalism. But um, I am hopeful that, um, that this COVID-19 has sort of shifted our um, mindset um, into thinking that um, you know, what is, what's happening here in Japan can affect the rest of the world and, and vice versa. So in that respect, we constantly see, um, of course, the COVID-19 related news on the front page of newspaper and, um, and it would be the item on the top of the uh, news that is reporting, being reported on the daily basis. But that doesn't mean that the viewers are not interested in paying attention to what's happening uh, beyond uh, Japan. Um, that is one. And about the funding, um, you know, at NHK, uh, when we join the organization, uh, each and every one of us have to go around knocking on the doors of our, our viewers, um, really? asking for the viewers to, to, to pay up or to listen to, to their uh, opinions about uh, what they like about NHK and um, what they don't like about NHK. Uh, and usually the public is very frank uh, with us. And um, it was a, a learning experience for, for me as well. And um, I, I shouldn't say surprisingly, but the close to 90% uh, pay up the uh, viewership fee, uh, even though there is no penalty for not uh, paying up in Japan. So I'd like to think that that, that says um, something about the, 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 the cred credibility um, that we have built um, among the, the viewers.
but that doesn't mean that, that we can be complacent in um, attracting our viewers to um, NHK channels. Well, thank you to the, you both. We're almost uh, out of time. So I'm going to finish with a, with a, um, a chairman's prerogative question to you both. We're in COVID time. We've been unable to travel, although I, I can reveal that I'm doing this, this uh, event from Zurich, my first trip uh, since the beginning of COVID. But um, each of you has one choice. Where would you really like to be traveling right now for making a film, for reporting? Where would you like to go, John? And then we'll go to you, Aiko. I would like to go to the farthest reaches of the Amazon, uh, in the Brazilian Amazon, to see what's happened to uh, a previously uncontacted tribe that I came across there in 1992. I almost did it just before COVID. We had the whole, we had the funding, we had everything. And then um, somebody uh, told us that the river that we'd have to travel along was um, too shallow at this time of year. And we'd have to wait a few months. I thought, oh, that's fine. But um, by March, I was uh, living uh, with the doors absolutely locked and slammed shut in in Oxford, not a chance of going. That's where I would be right now if I could. Splendid. Some strange tribes in Oxford, but not as interesting as in the Amazon. I think. <laughs> Aiko, where would you like to go as so your final, your last word? Oh, um, I, I had to debate between uh, Thailand or Myanmar. Uh, obviously, Thailand is where uh, things are quickly unfolding. But let me say perhaps uh, Myanmar, um, because um, my last visit before COVID-19 was to Myanmar in, in February. And I'd like to ask the people that I met then um, how they view the upcoming election. Uh, and if um, the, the leadership of Aung San Suu Kyi has um, made uh, positive changes to, to their life um, that, that they have. Um, because I do see that uh, there was a lot of uh, euphoria um, when the change was uh, brought about. But that doesn't mean that the change uh, brought about something positive for, for e each and every one of the uh, citizens um, who are living this very difficult time under COVID-19. Well, I look forward to you being able to, to do that. And uh, similarly, John, to the, uh, to the tribe in the Amazon, first met in the early 1990s. I want to thank you both for uh, giving your time and wonderful perspectives for uh, our audience and thank uh, Japan Society members and others for an uh, excellent uh, series of, of questions which showed a great deal of, of engagement um, in the issue, uh, which I'm delighted by. Um, at our next uh, webinar, we will be actually looking at uh, the development of women's football and the professional women's league that's about to open in Japan. Uh, and my colleague, Yuichiro Nakajima, who knows much more about this than I do, is going to be chairing next week's uh, uh, webinar with uh, Kelly Okajima Murray uh, on Japan and uh, uh, Kelly, sorry, Kiko uh, Okajima Murray in Japan and Kelly Simmons um, in, uh, in the UK from the Football Association, a very different subject. Um, I want to invite you all to come and join that. But meanwhile, let me thank again John Simpson, Oxford, and Aiko Doden in Tokyo for sharing your time and being with us. Thank you all very much and have a lovely evening in Tokyo and a lovely day in Oxford. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.